Calvary covers it all. I love that hymn. Wonderful thoughts. Paid for by the blood of Christ. He's the Lamb without blemish, without spot. Calvary covers it all. Doesn't matter what your past is like. Doesn't matter what you've gone through. Calvary covers it all. What a wonderful thought. Please take your Bibles and turn first to that passage over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, and then we'll look toward the end of the message at 1 Timothy 5, verse 4. Today is Parents' Day, and the question we raise is, do parents provide for children, or children provide for parents? And as you're taking and turning in your Bibles to those locations, let me strongly encourage you to read this article, Creation, Evolution, and the Handicap, uh, just this week, uh, I'm on a emailing mailing list from a public policy think tank, and they had an article about a child that they know is anencephalic. It hasn't been born yet. That means has no brain. But the parents have decided to bring the child to full term, not because they want to love that baby but so that they can donate the baby's organs. Bring the child to full term to kill the baby, to give the organs to someone else. You know, if you believe in evolution, things like that have no moral implications. If you believe in evolution, you might as well, as the governor of Colorado about 20 years ago said, much to the horror of many. The old people need to get out of the way and make room for all the young people who are coming up. He strongly encouraged and promoted euthanasia and assisted suicide, physician-assisted suicide. People, that's the culture we live in, and that's the culture that you may experience if you don't see it coming down the road. I encourage you to read that article. We'll be saying a few more words about that toward the end of the message. Proverbs chapter 1 tells us the purpose of the book of Proverbs. To teach us wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. Every one of those things relates to the issue of how parents should deal with their children and how children, especially as their parents get older, should deal with their parents. In the first two verses that we read today, we saw a duty that God requires of parents toward their children, and a duty that God requires of children toward their parents. Last year on Parents' Day, we talked about the four different divisions of the book of Proverbs, and how that affects us as parents and children. But I want to talk about something a little bit different today, though obviously, with many of the verses coming from Proverbs, some of those same things will fit in. When we talk about parents and children providing for one another, we discover that the provision that God requires falls into multiple categories. You have to provide in multiple categories. There are at least 10 ways, I hope you're taking notes, I'm going to give you a very organized list that I hope you will take and then use in the responsibilities that you have either as a child or as a parent. There are at least 10 ways in which parents must provide for their children. The first is quite obvious, and I'm not going to give lots of verses on this, it'll take us all day, but I'm going to give you sample verses throughout the message. Number one, providing for the spiritual nurture of the child. Providing for the spiritual nurture of the child in the context of a family that reflects the Trinity. Providing for the spiritual nurture of a child in the context of a family that reflects the Trinity. 
God did not design the church to provide the primary spiritual nurture for your children. God did not design summer Bible school to provide the primary nurture for your children. God did not design the Christian school to provide for the primary nurture of your children. God did not provide day camp or youth group or any other type of activity run by other adults to provide for the spiritual nurture of your children. That is the first and foremost responsibility of every Christian parent is to provide for the nurture of your children in the spiritual realm. Number two, providing for the physical well-being of the child. Now that's obvious, even the world understands that. That's why social services is out there to grab the parents who are not doing it. Because the world in general likes little kids, not like W.C. Fields, who couldn't stand kids. The world knows that we're supposed to take care of children. That's things like food and clothing and shelter and protection from danger. Sometimes the government comes in a little too close on things like that. You know there are folks out there who protest against getting immunizations, for example. They want to have authority over their children. You know about what's happening right now in Great Britain, in London, with little Charlie Gard, who is not quite one year old yet. And because he has a rare disease that affects his brain, the doctors just want to pull the plug and let him die. You've probably seen, I hope you have, some pictures of him on the internet, a very cute little guy. His parents are fighting it like mad. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of petitions have come out requesting that he be allowed to be transferred to the United States where there is a doctor who actually has seen him in the hospital in Great Britain and provide for him. Crowdfunding has covered all the costs, but the British government won't let him go. Our Congress actually passed a bill this past week to guarantee citizenship for his parents if they come to this country for treatment. Government sometimes goes way too far in what they think is the best interest of the child to pull the plug and kill him. Parents, and these parents are fighting very desperately for the life of their child, providing for the physical well-being of the child, food and clothing and shelter and protection from danger. The third area, which is perhaps something we don't often think about because we normally think about psychiatrists and other shrinks uh, with sort of an askance view, but the believer, according to scripture, is to provide for the mental health of the child. You say, what? Oh, what's that all about? That's teaching them right from wrong. That's when you have a mentally healthy child, when he understands the difference between right and wrong. The child who can't tell the difference between right and wrong, the child that has no conscience, the child that has seared his conscience, or has been taught to sear his conscience by his parents, doesn't view the world from the realistic viewpoint, that is God's viewpoint. He only views the world from the personal, selfish, self-centered viewpoint of what's good he thinks for him. Number four. We're going to go back and fill verses in on these, but I want you to get them. I hope we can get through this. Number four. Providing for the emotional stability of the child. Did you know there is one key thing? Just one key thing that parents can do to provide for the emotional stability of the child. The child that is confident that will have emotional stability is the child who knows not only that his parents love him, but that his parents love one another. When the father loves the wife, 
in the same manner that Christ loves the church. And the wife demonstrates her love for her husband and her trust in her husband that God will be able to work through her husband for her good by quietly submitting to his authority. That's what produces the stability in the home that gives the child emotional stability. He knows he is safe with these parents. He knows their love is real because he sees their love as they love one another. Not as they're fighting with each other, not as they're throwing things at each other, not as they're having temper tantrums and beating on the doors and kicking their feet. But as they love one another and reflect the love of Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father, then they can believe that there is a God who is like that because they see him reflected in dad and mom. Number five is very important. Very important. Providing for the moral purity of the child. Providing for the moral purity of the child. How do you do that? Well, first, we have to teach the moral principles of the book of Proverbs and elsewhere throughout the scripture, in particular, God's holy standard of marriage. One man and one woman for life till death do us part. When they understand that life is not a merry-go-round where you can get on and off and on and off and on and off with different partners. When they understand moral purity, that will give them a solid peace that nothing can take from them. We have more to say about that in a few moments. But teaching the moral principles and God's standards for marriage, guarding the child from sinful friends, Guarding the child from sinful activities. Guarding the child from sinful people who would take advantage of the child. There are adults out there who do that. And lots of them try to creep into churches and get involved in child and youth activities so that they can, as moral perverts, harm children. And I'm always happy when I hear that somebody like that has gone to jail and they've thrown the key away. Number six, here's one that most of us think about, especially as we get older and our children get older and we've accumulated stuff, providing for the financial well-being of the child. Providing for the financial well-being of the child. This includes teaching the child biblical financial principles. <laughs> providing for well the financial well-being doesn't just mean giving your kids money. You know, there are a lot of kids out there that get a handout. They get their weekly allowance. And some parents just say, go spend whatever you want. And some parents say, well, now we're going to give this part to God. And we're going to put this part in savings. And we're going to uh, figure out something that we're going to wisely do with the rest of this. And you can put more in savings if you want. You can give more to God if you want. But don't squander it. Think wisdom. These are good principles. You're teaching kids biblical principles of finance. There's an entire seminar out there. I hope all of you hear it at some time. I did play it here at the church about eight years ago. You need to hear it, the whole thing, all the way through. 20 lessons. Biblical financial principles. Teach them those principles so that they will never be a burden to themselves or to others. We live in a country that is being drowned in the welfare state. The way that you provide for the financial well-being of your child is teach them what God says about financial resources. But you not only work it out for them so that they are learning to live that way, but you must set the example of fiscal responsibility by the way in which you use your resources. 
You also can provide for them not only in time present, that is, teaching the child the work to say, you know, things that relate to the principles we just talked about, but also for the future. Because you see, as you set the example, you will be, in fact, accumulating an inheritance of temporal substance that someday will be left to the child at the time of your death. Now, you know, I preached on this, oh, maybe three or four years ago, about how you're not obligated to leave money to your kids if, in fact, they have rejected Christ or have rejected biblical principles of finance, if they're spendthrifts, if they go out and use it on drugs and alcohol and cigarettes, if they have cursed you to your face, you have no responsibility to leave it to them because you are not an owner, you're a steward of the money that God gives to you. All of us who are parents understand that we're stewards and we have to deal with the stewardship very carefully because the more kids you've got, the more difficult it is to make sure that everything goes around and it stretches. But we're not owners, we're stewards. You don't have to leave it to a child who is in rebellion against you or in rebellion against God. There are a lot of principles that are given in this Proverbs, especially about that. Let me just give you a couple. Be not thou one of them that strike hands, or of them that are sureties for debt. Be in a cosign or a loan, for example. Or how about Proverbs 22, 27, If thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? See, thou a man diligent in his business, he shall stand before kings, he shall not stand before mean men. Number seven. Providing for the appropriate social interaction of the child with others. Did you know the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about that? Whenever we heard the word social, we tend to cringe if we're conservative. But providing for the appropriate social interaction of the child with others. For example, how are they supposed to relate to adults as a child? God has standards for that. The kids are not in control. Did you know that? They're not supposed to be anyway. They're supposed to be under authority. The social interaction of how to choose friends wisely. There's a humongous amount in the book of Proverbs about that. The social interaction of how to avoid wrong friends. Or how to relate to siblings. Your brothers or your sisters. Oh, all you girls out there. How to relate to your sisters. The Bible has something to say about that. Do you know that? Parents are supposed to teach it. We're supposed to teach our children how to respond to not only the authority of the parents, but to others. That's the context of the home. It's a training ground so that when they get out of the home, they'll know the principles of authority. How to respond to the authority that God has placed in the child's life. How do you socially interact? Let me give you a couple of illustrations from Scripture. Who should you avoid, for example? Proverbs 22, 24, and 25. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. That's dealing with social interactions. Certain kind of people that you don't have for friends because otherwise, you become like your friends. That area about social interaction also involves teaching a child how to control his tongue and his mouth, as well as many other areas of human behavior and social interaction, learning how to control the temper, learning not to whine, learning not to pout, learning not to be a bully, learning not to try to buck the system, learning to be friendly, and so on and so on. And you're teaching your children to be mature adults. That's an important heritage to pass on. Let me give you just a few that relate to the mouth. Proverbs 22, 17 through 21. God on thine ear and hear the words of the wise. Apply thine heart unto my knowledge. For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. They shall withal be fitted in thy lips. Have not I written to thee excellent things in the counsels of knowledge? That I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth. 
that thou might answer, that's speaking, that's using your mouth, that thou might answer the words of truth to them that send thee. You know, the book of James is loaded with that issue of the tongue. If any man among you seem to be religious and brightleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. James 3.8 but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. You can't tame it by yourself. It's not a matter of personal self-control. It's a matter of being filled with the Spirit of God. For out of the heart, Jesus said, the mouth speaketh. What comes out of your mouth? It tells the world what's in your heart. That's why that number one issue of spiritual provision for your children is so important because only the Word of God can cleanse their hearts and produce good fruit that comes out their mouth, not only to the glory of God, but within the social interaction to the benefit of others. 1 Peter 3.10 Do you like, do you like being alive? Do you like it when you have a good day? You know, do you really not like it when you have a bad hair day? Peter tells you how to have a good day and not a bad hair day. For he that will love life and see good days, now here it is, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no God. That is deceit. In other words, don't lie. John 8, 44, Jesus says that all lies are from the devil. The devil is the father of lies. When you tell a lie to get yourself out of a difficult situation, what you are doing is trusting the devil to get you out of the situation rather than trusting the one who is the truth to get you out of the situation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When you tell the truth, you're trusting God. When you tell a lie, you're trusting the devil. You may never have thought of that, but you better think about it the next time you want to open your mouth and tell a lie. You're trusting the devil to get you out of that difficult spot that you stupidly got into. 1 John 3, verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed. Be careful what you say. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 31, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Your words are either gonna exonerate you or they're gonna condemn you. He'll just play the tape back and say, well, let's hear what you said about that. And there you'll be looking at the screen and say, oh no, did I say that? Yeah. As we teach our children, we have to help them understand that all of our words have consequences just like all of our actions have consequences. Number eight. Here's one you may not have thought much about in terms of the Bible. But did you know the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about this? Number eight. Providing for the academic education of your child. What? I mean, there's something in the book of Proverbs about the academic education? Yeah, except they didn't teach them back in those days the way that we do with this mindless public school system where they get indoctrinated all day long with all kinds of wickedness. They taught them at home. They many times had a household slave, uh, a pedagogue. Uh, you've heard of pedagogy. You know, that is the teaching. Well, that's actually a disciplinarian term. That instructor had the right to beat the child if he didn't learn his lessons. Book of Proverbs has a lot to say about academics. A key word for academic learning in the Bible is the word instruction. It is, in fact, one of the key reasons that the book of Proverbs was written. Let me give you just a few verses from that one book. Back there when we talked about those opening three verses,
verses where it talks about the purpose. It says, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. And he tells you where you have to start. It was the very first thing that parents are responsible for their children. Verse 7 tells us, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. It's the communication, the passing on of the spiritual heritage that is essential. Let me just read you a few of these verses. I won't list all the references. I mean, this is all the way through the book of Proverbs. I mean, it's over and over. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. That's parents teaching their kids. Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. Take fast hold of instruction, let her not go, keep her, she is thy life. And say, how have I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof. He shall die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and the reproofs of instruction are the way of life. You know, all of you, when you grow up, all you young people especially, you're probably going to have a job. It's going to be your way of life. It's going to be what you do for the rest of your life. Now, some of you may do more than one thing. You may start out in something and think, man, there is no way I'm ever going to managed to finish this, but I see from my experience, now here's something I really enjoy doing, and that's what I'm going to focus on for the rest of my life. God has gifted you, we'll talk about that in a second, God has gifted you with certain talents and abilities and spiritual gifts that He designs for you to use and to maximize your potential and parents we are responsible for directing our children so that they can maximize the potential that God has given to them. Hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. Receive instruction, not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. This is academic, folks. He is in the way of life that keepeth instruction, but he that refuseth reproof erreth. Whoso loveth instruction loveth knowledge. That's academic. But he that hateth reproof is brutish. A wise son heareth his father's instruction. Wise daughters do too. But a scorner heareth not rebuke. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction. You never learn how to do anything, you're going to be a bum sit on the curb. But he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. Do you notice how many times reproof is said in contrast with instruction? He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul, but he that heareth reproof giveth understanding. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. You know, I've run into so many people. I have some in extended family who think that they know everything. You can't teach them anything. It boggles the mind. And you know, those ones who know everything are absolutely not successful at anything. Because they think they know it all. Nobody can teach them how to do this or that or the other thing. So they never learn, and so they never get good at anything, and they never do it. They just criticize everybody else who is doing it. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Understanding is a wellspring of life to him that hath it, but the instruction of fools is folly. You can't teach a fool. Hear counsel. Receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy letter end. Cease, my son. There's a kind of instruction you're not supposed to listen to. It's like the evolutionary stuff and the moral relativism that's being taught in the public school. Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth to err from the words of knowledge. Apply thy heart unto instruction, and thine ears to the word of knowledge. By the truth, sell it not, wisdom and instruction and understanding. I think you get the idea. And that's just a few of the verses in Proverbs that talk about it. That's one of the chief 
reasons for homeschooling. Parents are responsible for building into the academic education of their children. Number nine, providing the necessary sets of skills and spiritual gifts that God has given to the child. You've got to provide the necessary setting for the skill set that God gave your kids. You have to provide the necessary setting for the spiritual gifts that God has given to your children. Now the second one, we'll take that first. That's the easier of the two. Because what is the setting for the exercise of the spiritual gifts? We're meeting today. What's it called? The church. The spiritual gifts are not given to build up the world. The spiritual gifts are given to edify the body of Christ. As parents, you should be very carefully examining your children, and grandparents too, you can certainly help with this, so that you can help them discover their spiritual gift and learn to use it. Oh, the same thing is true for their talents. I can remember one of my children was just a tiny little boy, but he loved to carve things out of wood. You know, balsa wood is fun for kids. And lots of little boys make airplanes and fire trucks and, you know, maybe those cars that they use in Atlanta for those races, the soapbox and every kind of things. But he liked to carve with cameras and violins. Tiny ones. Little teeny tiny ones like that. The Lord hit me upside the head one day and said, you know, I think that boy has an interest in music. In fact, I think he has an interest in piano and violin. So I went out, just, you know, I didn't have a lot of money, but I thought, if that's a gift that he's got, I want to develop it. And I bought him a violin, a bow, and a case. Brand new. Now you can tell the quality of it when you hear the price. I got the violin, the bow, and the case. Oh, and I think a little thing of rosin too, with a little a chamois on it. 100 bucks. <laughs> that is one cheap violin. I mean, not worth much. That boy was so excited, and I gave him lessons. I brought him to a violin teacher who taught him how to finger the violin and how to bow correctly. And he would practice four, five, six hours a day without being told. He loved it. He wore the bridge of that violin out. It had been dark ebony, and after he had played for two or three months, all the black was wearing off down the wood underneath. Parents, God expects you to learn your children. Find the gifts that he's given to them. Encourage them to develop those gifts. Their spiritual gifts and the physical skills that he's given to them as well. That can be anything from knitting and sewing to auto mechanics, from the gift of pastor teacher to the gift of helps. Number 10, providing the disciplinary structure that the child needs to curb his old sin nature. Providing the disciplinary structure that the child needs to curb his old sin nature. What is that? That means his propensity to sin. Children are not good by nature. They are born dead in trespasses and sins. They're sweet and they're nice and they're fun to play with, but they have an old sin nature and it manifests itself, some more than in others. Some do it quite openly and loudly. Others do it with a more sneaky, demeanor, or they're creeping around and doing things and then reading that you didn't catch them. But they all have an old sin nature. And part of what we provide for our children, and we must, it's required by God, is the disciplinary structure that the child needs to curb his old sin nature. That's a major area that you must deal with when you teach children to obey. 
you've got to start with obeying the parents, otherwise they'll never be in obedience to any other authority that God puts in their life. How do you get them to obey? Proverbs 22, 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from you. I know all you kids so were very excited to hear that, right? The rod of correction shall drive it far from you. And you know, the more you spank, the farther it goes away. So, hey, doesn't that sound great for parents? Of course, we live in a society where they call that child abuse. But you know, the ultimate result will be the ability to obey the command of Ephesians 6.1 and Colossians 3.20. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And in Colossians, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. This is what we provide for our children when we discipline them. This obedience to parents is a sign that a society is corrupted and on its way out, that it's under the judgment of God. The Apostle Paul speaks of this in his discussion of what's going to happen in the last day. He lists it as one of the decadent moral sins that God hates. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And I know we've looked at ten different areas here, and a lot of those different areas can be uh, linked together under the heading of character training. In short, those areas of provision enable the child to live a productive life for the glory of God. And that's what Proverbs 22, 6 is all about. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Training is different from teaching. Training involves more than the academic head knowledge, although that's one component. Training involves teaching truth and skills. It involves setting example, that is, you show them how to do it. I remember how much fun it was working with my little tiny boys on that beat up old house down in Alabama, uh, teaching them how to put in windows, teaching them how to run electric, teaching them how to put in plumbing. I mean, it was wonderful because the town didn't require us to get any permits to do any of that. It was great teaching the little boys how to do something with their hands, which they all still know how to do today. Number three, making the child actually do it. You can teach truth and skills. You can set an example on how to do it. But you know, it doesn't help if the child doesn't do it. You've got to make the child actually do it repeatedly until the child understands what to do, how to do it, when to do it, why to do it. And training also involves instilling a desire in the child to do it without having to force the child or having him wait until he's told to do it. Character training. Character training involves instilling a desire inside the child to do what he ought to do rather than forcing an external motivation on him through restraints and compulsion. The book of Proverbs was designed by God as a child instruction manual for the purpose of teaching character and wisdom and life goals. It deals with everything from salvation to the moment of death, from energy to eternity, from courtship to business relationship, from sloth to sex, from pride to poverty, from political astuteness in times of peace to dealing with enemies in times of war, from interpersonal relationships and friendship to the discerning of the wrong kind of friends, from money to morals, from priority to posterity. There are no areas of human life that it does not touch upon. Proverbs tells you how to prepare for life, how to live life, and how to die in a manner that is pleasing to God. Training children in all these areas is what a parent must do for his children to fulfill the divine command. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's a command, it's not optional. If our children depart when they are old, we have failed to obey what God commanded. We've not done our job. There may be some intermediate rebellion, but the promise is concerning how they will end their lives. If they end their lives outside the ways of God, we did not do what God wanted us to do. In Scripture, God gives many commands that always have a direct impact on results. By the way, that's in the New Testament as well. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, 
but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And the word translated nurture is the word elsewhere translated chastening. To nurture your children includes corporal punishment. And you provoke them to anger if you never have spanked your kids. Discipline, instruction, teaching. You know that's the three-legged stool. I've talked about it many times before. But all three legs are necessary, absolutely, in raising children. Instruction is teaching your children the rules, the ways of God, for living a life that pleases Him. Discipline not only means insisting that the child follows certain basic patterns and habits of life, but it also includes corporal punishment when those little rascals are disobedient, when they're stubborn, when they're recalcitrant. Example means that you must personally not only know what the Bible tells you that you must do, but you must publicly, as well as privately, and consistently do it so that your children and grandchildren have a role model to follow. They can see in you how it's supposed to be done. You know, it's like teaching swimming. It's a lot easier if you're in the pool with a kid. You can show them how it's done. And then as they're learning the Australian crawl, you're there holding them up under their stomach. They're learning to kick. They're learning to do the crawl. They're learning to do the breaststroke. They're learning to do the backstroke. And a lot of them, like me, learning to swim to the bottom of the pool and see how long they can hold their breath. Example. To be the example for your children, you have to do it. You know, we're talking about what parents provide for their children, but Christian parents often personally rebel in the areas of discipline. For example, in the area of discipline, they've been deceived by Benjamin Spock's modern psychology that says you must never spank your kid or you'll warp him. The modernist crowd really wants you to reason with him like you would reason with a thoughtful adult. But a child is not an adult. He doesn't think like an adult who can rationally weigh beneficial and negative outcomes in the undefined future. I heard on the radio this past week, they did an experiment in which they offered children a small reward that they could have right then, or a larger reward, like you can get a little candy right now, or you can get a big candy if you wait for an hour. What did most of the children choose? They wanted a little candy now. Deferred gratification is one of the marks of an adult. Where we learn to say, yes, Lord, I will obey you now, even though I don't see the results right now. We always want everything right now, right now. It's the microwave mentality. You know, 30 seconds, man, come on, come on, hurry up. Beep it, beep it, so that I can get it out. But God takes time to develop character. But the benefits are literally out of this world. Well, if only we could learn that. It really doesn't matter what pop psychology says if the God who made your child tells you to do something different. Some parents have been deceived, but they've also been intimidated by the draconian legal morass of child protective services. Other Christian parents are simply lazy and rather not confront the strong-willed rebel. They would rather ignore the little brats so they can lounge on the couch eating chocolate while they watch their daily soap operas, or chat on the phone with their friends, sharing all the latest juicy gossip circ circulating around the church. Let's talk about example. What are you personally doing, both positive and negative? There are far too many Christian parents and grandparents who say, in effect, do what I say, not what I do. If that's how you live, you're a hypocrite. Jesus called hypocrites hypocrites too. How are you setting the example for your children and grandchildren? What about the area of instruction? Didactic teaching is always necessary to communicate truth. Even Jesus had to stoop to that. He had to resort to didactic teachings because he was dealing with people. But God has given a special responsibility in this area to parents that he has not given to the church. He's not given it to the Christian school, the Christian camp, or the youth group, or the babysitters, or higher tutors, 
God gives children to parents, not to the government or any other surrogate spoon feeder. You cannot teach what you yourself do not personally know. So you say, well, you know, I'm having a hard time doing the academics, but then you need to learn. You know, when Judy and I homeschooled all of our kids, and you know they all did very well academically when they got out of our home school, we learned a very important secret. I'll, tell, I'll share it with you. You only have to stay one day ahead of the child. You can read the textbook as well as they can, and you'll understand it a lot better. You only have to stay one day ahead of the child. You teach in Spanish, learn the lesson for tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes around, you teach that lesson while you're learning the lesson for the next day. How about math? How about creation science? There are incredible resources on that, you know that. How about English grammar? How about spelling and punctuation? Give them a list of spelling words that you've learned, that you've studied. You only have to stay one day ahead. That's important when it comes to theology. You might say, well, I don't know systematic theology. Well, why not? You've got a Bible. You quote the Catechism by Root every Sunday in Sunday school. Have you ever been to a Christian bookstore? Do you know that they carry summaries of Christian doctrine and scripture references? How much time do you personally spend every day studying? And not just glancing at it, you know, we'll have about five hundred devotions. How much time do you spend every day studying the Word of God? Do you understand how valuable this is? To have the Bible in your own language. There are people around the world who are willing to die if they get caught with a copy of this book. That's how much it means to them. There are many who have died for owning a copy of this book. And they read it in caves, and they go out in the forest to read it, and they, they hide under their beds and read it with a flashlight. I can remember when I went to camp as a Boy Scout, the, the scoutmaster would say, okay, lights out. Some of the guys would have comic books. And they would be in their sleeping bags with their flashlight. You could sort of see the gleam around this because they were busy reading the comic books. Kids have more interest in comic books than most Christians have in the Bible. Add it up in your mind. How much time this past week? Seven days. Think about Sunday through yesterday, Saturday. How much time did you actually spend studying the Bible, not just reading a chapter so that you could do the Bible in a year? I think we're all going to stand before God and He's going to say, I gave you a treasure and you didn't even bother to look at it? Parents, how can you expect your kids to study the Bible if you don't study the Bible yourself? Instruction, discipline, and example. That's the three-legged stool. We've talked about it many different times. It cannot stand up if one leg is missing. That raises the question, so what exactly does what God want us to do? Most Christian parents don't have a clue outside the vague general notion they should teach the kids about Jesus and hope they get saved. And that is really, really weak. It probably means the parent is a sloth when it comes down to studying the scripture and applying it to himself or herself. We read those opening verses of Proverbs. It's designed to give instruction and wisdom and justice and judgment and equity. Now let's talk about children providing for their parents. That clock is stopped. I just realized it says 5 of 12 and it isn't 5 of 12. Okay, real quick. Talk about children providing for their parents. I'm not talking about child slave labor. I'm not talking about sending your kids off to work in a factory to earn family income, although sometimes when my kids were growing up, I wish I could get them out of the house, put them someplace where they really had to work. That's not what I'm talking about. We're talking about the other end of life. The other end of life. Parents provide for children at the beginning of life. Children provide for parents at the end of life. 
That's that verse in 1 Timothy 5, 4. But if any widow have children or nephews, and that word nephews is the word for grandchildren, so you have responsibility to your grandparents too, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents. Old English word for to pay them back. They've poured their lives into you. Now they're getting old. It's time for a valuable payback. Why? Because it says, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now this verse in particular is talking about widows. Because the first responsibility for providing for a spouse always falls on the other spouse, not on the children. But the children are the second line of defense when the first line of defense fails. Notice something important in Scripture also. Most people, they, they fly right over this. They never see it. Notice something that's very important in Scripture. There is no such thing in Scripture as a nursing home or a retirement community with a bunch of old people spending their kids' inheritance on cruises while they lollygag around. There's no such thing as those things in Scripture. Parents, whether young or older, always seen in the family group context. Every place in the Bible. The old people are always seen in the family group context. There are no exceptions. Here in America, we've bought into the pagan idea. We've gotten used to shipping the old guys off to some facility where they're most likely to receive elder abuse and be stuck in a corner with a wheelchair. You know, that kind of thing happens in hospitals, even to young people. Years and years and years ago, I was in my 30s, and uh, I was pastoring a church up in North Jersey. And before I figured out what the problem was and how to deal with it, I got kidney stones two or three times a month. Now, if you've ever had them once, you know how painful that is. I was getting two or three times a month. And one time, I had to actually be taken to a local hospital. And uh, they gave me their all kinds of treatments they give you for kidney stones, some of them quite unpleasant. And you know what the nurses did? They had put a bunch of us in wheelchairs, because we're supposed to be in wheelchairs, you know, when the exercise of rolling around. And they took me and they stuck me in a corner, facing the corner. Well, they all went off and drank coffee and had donuts. Now folks, is that the way you're supposed to treat your parents? You've probably heard the horror stories about abuse that takes place in nursing homes where because the patient has perhaps some dementia, the staff beats them, treats them roughly, doesn't feed them. You don't find that in the Bible. You always see the elderly in the context of a home. Children should care for their parents all the way to the end of their natural lives. You heard at the beginning of this message today, my mother-in-law went into a coma a few days ago. She's almost 97 years old. She may be on her way to heaven very soon. But you know something? She has been cared for over the past 20 years by her children in their homes. Tough to care for. Strong-willed person. Big and heavy. And my wife was not a big and heavy person. Had to get her in and out of bed with an electric lift. Get her across the floor to her wheelchair to roll her here to church or to get her into the car, we'd use the electric lift to put her in a wheelchair, roll her out of the car, use the electric lift to get her out of the wheelchair, into the car, to take her to the doctor, do the same thing on the other end, lift her out of the chair, and then put her out of the car, into the chair, and then take her in to see the doctor. On a regular basis, two or three times a month, my wife never complained. My brother-in-law, his wife, was about half the size of Judy. Tiny little person. She's been caring for Grandma with her daughter 
children and grandchildren caring for the aged parents and grandparents with her daughter ever since Judy went to heaven three years ago. Folks, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's an expression of love. The parents cared for us when we were tiny babies making multiple messes in our pants every day. They cleaned us up, they loved us, they hugged us, they kissed us. They cleaned our hair, washed it gently. I remember Judy washing her mom's hair, even though her mom couldn't really get out of bed. Having a bowl there and gently washing her hair. Giving her sponge baths. Our parents loved us that way when we were children. And God says at the end of life, that's the responsibility of a child in providing for his or her parents. My sister cared for my mother for about 15 years even after she got where she could no longer speak or move. She would have to lift her and turn her in her bed so she wouldn't get bed sores. You see, there's a God in heaven who loves us as his children. And we love him as our heavenly father. And your actions show your love. But America has gotten away from it. Your actions prove what you believe. God designed the family to be that way. A seamless web from birth to death. facing it once again. Someday, my children will probably have to take care of me. Maybe I'll die suddenly. My dad died suddenly. Judy died suddenly. You may or may not die suddenly. What will happen when you get to the point when you cannot care for yourself. Parents Day. It's a wonderful celebration of life and godliness. And we should make it an example to the rest of the world what it really means to be a Christian. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power for the amazing different areas of responsibility that we have as parents for our children. And how much of that is mirrored at the end of our lives when our children, if they've learned scripture, if they've learned their spiritual responsibilities, how they reciprocate, how they reflect with love, with love, what was done for them when they were tiny babies. Our society has become a utilitarian society where the old people, they say, have to get out of the way for the young ones. The young ones never realizing that someday they'll be the old ones. Teach us, Father, to number our days that we might apply our hearts to wisdom. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.